Well, originally, I mean, I got a very brief breakdown saying Seth MacFarlane, L.A., straight to series, sci-fi, space, comedy, 400 years in the future. Isaac, machine, artificial, life form. And all we knew was he had a very blank uh, outer shell, but with red eyes. So this is him... But these were red, which we have seen in season one with Isaac. Um, and then in season two, obviously, we've seen a lot of Kalon with red eyes and uh, some with orange eyes. But you can tell that Isaac with red eyes is kind of menacing. So I think they figured early on that baby blues was perhaps a better way to go. So I had this audition um, come through like every other one. And I thought this is totally cool and uh, so utterly unique compared to all the auditions I normally go up for so I thought I'm going to work really hard on this one and uh, auditioned in London and the tape was sent off to uh, the big bad boys in the States and uh, yeah I mean within 24 hours we'd heard that Seth had watched the tape and liked it which was pretty surreal because um, you don't normally res expect that response anyway for an audition so that was that and then you know a couple of times they threatened to take me over to the States for a a studio test with the producers and <laughs> twice they were like no it's fine you you've you've done this tape and it's it's enough and six weeks later I finally got off of the part which is great I was I just touched down in Barcelona for a holiday and I got a voicemail from my agent saying that I got it and what a great way to start a, a holiday right so I was very pleased yeah. Well, I don't know. I mean, it's a vocal part, very much yeah. a vocal part. And I think Seth was very much looking for that right part. He'd, they'd been auditioning for both this part and Bortus um, in Australia, America, Canada, New Zealand, the UK. Like, they'd really thrown the net very wide. And I think Seth was sort of working his way through a lot of tapes. And I don't know, something must have clicked in his head yeah. vocally. But when it came to actually getting to set and getting in the costume and doing it... Um, I think that what I thought from the start was he needed to have an economy of movement. You know, he's a machine. He wouldn't move unless he has to. It's not impulsive. You know, yeah. humans are impulsive. We always move. We're constantly moving. Look, both of us are <coughs> having this. But Isaac would never do that. So remembering that was very important. And I think also for me to move away from very famous artificial life forms that are out there, a fluidity of movement was very important. I wanted to move away from a kind of, you know. Well, you know, I think it's just, he's genuinely weird, which is just so appealing, isn't it? I think, you know, in the age of social media, when people are trying to be not as weird as possible, um, to see someone who is so embracing of their own weirdness is just refreshing. Not wanting to conform, not wanting to act like people think he should act. I, well, he is, yeah. And he's certainly not afraid to tell them that either. I think, I think that that is quite enduring. You know, I, I, I think people will love him for that. But he's not, you know, in the same way that he doesn't have the capacity to be kind, he doesn't have the capacity to be cruel. Does he not? I don't know. I mean, open to... Uh, yeah, well, he's, you know, we must remember he's run by algorithms. He is not run by emotions and not run by impulses. Kind and, kind and cruel tend to come from feelings of insecurity or feelings of love or feelings of, I don't know, ownership in some way. When he doesn't have any of these. So it's important to remember that. And I, I constantly have to drag myself back into that. You know, because some of his lines could be interpreted in a romantic way, let's say, or a, a mean way. But you can't afford to actually perform them like that. You know, if you go back to a happy refrain, uh, uh, this season to episode six, you know, Isaac, I got, he got a girlfriend, which is great. But you know what, his, his, um, his algorithms had adapted to having Claire around. And if we take that logical stream, that that is what's happening to Isaac on a daily basis being aboard the Orville, not only to do with Claire, but to do with 
all the other characters and all the experiences that he's having. I mean, let's not forget he was on a planet for 700 years. So surely his algorithms would have changed in that time. And so is it any wonder that when we see him in the setting of all the other Kalons that he acts and thinks differently? Who knows? The sky's the limit with him. I mean, the more experiences he has, the more relationships he has, the more he'll change, I'm guessing. Loved it. Oh, beautiful. I mean, it was well balanced, it was well written, it was just so well acted by Penny and everyone else who was involved. We saw Norm MacDonald pop up, you know. Um, we, had a, we had an orchestra. I mean, it was just wonderful, really. And a wonderful tribute to musical, musical uh, films from, you know, the Hollywood's golden era. Like, yeah, it was great to be part of that. And I, I was delighted when I read it. I remember Seth at the Christmas party at the end of 2017 saying to me, Mark, Mark, I've got a script for you. You're going to love it. You're going to get, he didn't say you're going to get a girlfriend, but he said, uh, we're going to meet, we're going to meet humanizer, which is lovely. And uh, yeah, I mean, I was excited about it from then. So yeah, great one. Well, I think good, I think good sci-fi has to rely on good science and liberties can be taken because it's so far in the future that we don't understand, we don't understand the science that the science is based on let alone the science that it is. So, so I think that's fine, but you have, to, you have to see the logical route to getting to it. And I believe that applies to most science fiction, all science fiction, which is why a lot of science fiction is not good, as far as I'm concerned. But the, you know, the Orville does, the Orville has holes, I'm not gonna say it doesn't, and I see them myself now and again, I'm certainly not gonna say what they are, but you know, I think majoritively it is true to itself and true to science, and I, I love that for it. I genuinely think that the episodic nature of the show lends itself to being more dramatic or more comedic as each episode goes along. I mean, it can, it can sort of be more playful, which I like very much. Um, and it allows the fans to have different favorites. Or opposites, and, in, and it, you know, it creates debate. It allows for an actual forum where people can, you know, discuss the show in an exciting way. I think the show is more confident now. So it, if you see an episode in season two that is more dramatic than in season one, it's because we feel like we have the confidence to do that. And similarly, if you see one that is hilarious in season two, it's because we have the confidence to push the comedy even further. So it, it, I think it's about that. It's about, you know, the show is still finding itself as well. And it will continue to do so as, um, political and socio-economic events around us change and also the audiences change, you know. It shows, it shows have to be adaptive, yeah. And I think with the first episode of season two, which was so character-based, that, you know, we really felt that. We really felt, wow, we've got living, breathing creatures in front of us. And I think that's a testament after one season that that, that, that was the case. Yes, it is. It felt like a movie to film, I tell you that. <laughs> yeah. That was exciting because it has a different pace, a two-parter. I mean, you have to wrap up a lot in one episode and set it up, do it, wrap it up. But as I say, you know, because of the episodic nature of things, you know, each, each episode is a movie. And then to do a two-episode, a two-parter, is like doing a huge movie, but it does have a sort of little break in between. So, you know, that was kind of fun. And we actually play with that formula, that format, again later on this season. You have another two-parter coming your way, and it is epic. It could have been an, a season finale, couldn't it? And it would have worked beautifully as a season finale, but, and I'll let you in on a little secret, it was the original season one finale, those two episodes, yeah. We had more to tell before we got there, I think. We had more characters to introduce. We had to get further into the relationships with the characters on the ship before we got to that stage. You know? Yeah, I think, I think it was a good decision. And I think, you know, it, as you say, it's allowed us to shake things up in the middle of season two to build up to whatever might happen next.